Hi, this is your host, Sapin Bhartia, and welcome to your first talk. Today, we have with us Bastian Hoffman, Director of Enterprise Solutions at Quadrant. Bastian, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure to host you here today. And this is the first time I'm talking to someone from Quadrant, so I would love to know a bit about the company. What do you folks do? We do and provide a vector database that is completely open source. And we've been doing this for like... The project started like three years ago as an open source project, and we saw then much, much more demand coming up. Uh, so we founded a company around that to serve them customers worldwide in yeah, developing these vector databases and then developing solutions around that. How would you define vector databases? And second would be, what role are they playing in the modern world? I'm not looking at a specific industry. We will talk about things like generative AI, but in general, you know. The idea behind vector databases is, in the end, storing vectors and making searches and recommendations based on vectors very efficiently. And use cases for that can be everything from recommendation systems, anomaly detection, um, semantic search on unstructured and structured data, even images, text searches, video searches, to generative AI. Now let's talk about, you know, uh, what problem are they solving for enterprises who are building AI-based, especially LLMs and generative AI-based uh, applications? A lot of enterprises want to build uh, generative AI solutions like a chatbot, for example, based on their own private proprietary data that they have internally. Things like intranets, wikis that they have, manuals they have, support tickets. And of course, they could start training their own LLM based on their internal data, but that quickly costs millions of euros because co training an LLM is very expensive. And there, vector databases come into play because you can use a pre-trained LLM. You can pipe your private data through this. You get vectors out of that, and you can store these vectors then in vector databases and use them when for searches and querying the vector database with a chatbot to provide additional private context. How RAG and vector search work together? And also, if you can talk about the role quadrant playing in further democratizing those technologies, as you said, you know, you folks leverage, you know, the open source, you know, but open source can solve day one problem. <laughs> you have to make it easier to, to consume those open source technologies as well. Maybe taking a step back and talking about how Quadrant was founded, like, and how the project was created three years ago, um, helps with this telling the story because the founders exactly had problems doing efficient vector search. Um, that was more, more semantic search back then, not generative AI, and there just wasn't any good solution that was open source out there that was just easy to operate and scale on the scale that they have. Um, and that's why they created Quadrant and then started open sourcing it. And especially now with generative AI, we are seeing that the amount of vectors and the amount of data sizes uh, that come out of it are growing and growing and massively. You're not only talking about tens of thousands of vectors that you want to store somewhere, but quickly about millions and billions of vectors. And there, um, specialized vector databases become really important to offer like the scale that you need to serve this in a very cost efficient way. And um, dedicated vector databases like Quadrant can do this very efficiently with different techniques, for example, things like compression and quantization of vectors, which Quadrant pioneered, or things like having efficient filtering around this. Can you talk about how RAG and vector search work together and how Quadrant makes it more democratized in one way or mm -hmm. another? The idea, again, behind Genetive AI and RAG is that you can store your private information that comes through the uh, pre-trade LLM um, that you can just use an open source one, for example, to store this in vector databases. And due to the massive scale, the dedicated vector database makes a lot of sense there. And since you're also using very sensitive data, potentially, um, think about like a medical use case where you maybe even have patient data in there, having an open source solution like Quadrant just democratizes makes this much more democratic and creates a lot of freedom of where you want to host your data, where you want to host the vector database without locking you in into a proprietary solution, um, without having to ship data to some data center that you are not under your control. And you um, then also, that allows even to actually operate this. Because again, medical data, you may have regulations and laws in place to not ship the data that you have to like some other country and with open source and free to use and free to run software, you can actually do this and build the solutions based on the requirements and regulations that you have. As organizations embrace, you know, these latest technology, they want to leverage some of these technologies. What are some of the pain points that you have seen people face 
uh, when you know they deal with you know vector databases and uh, how Quadrant solves that for them? One of them, uh, and the first one is probably a very traditional one when talking about any kind of operations of databases in general is the operative part of running stateful applications on a massive scale. We are not running on only like on one tiny VM, but on potentially hundreds of servers. Um, and there, um, Quadrant has like a very easy to operate design where all the different components that the database needs are shipped as one container image. And you can just boot the same image um, on like as many nodes as you want. You can easily vertically and horizontally scale this and have, instead of having to operate multiple services uh, that all have to configure, be configured consistently, um, that you all need um, then also to be upgraded in a certain way. Having everything built within Quadrant makes it a lot easier to operate. This is like one big pain point. And the other one is then about data sovereignty, like where is my data actually hosted? And uh, there are also Quadrant being open source solution helps that you can just run this wherever you want, being it on premise, on your own data center, even on your own laptop during development, being it in the cloud or as a managed service and through our managed cloud or hybrid cloud offering. And you folks also recently announced uh, Quadrant's hybrid cloud what is the idea behind this offering mm. and what is it? I already touched before on like the different ways how you can run Quadrant. And uh, one thing that works very well for like smaller companies, if you want to start up, is using just like a managed cloud offering that we have since like one and a half years already, where we take over the complete management and running of Quadrant databases for our customers. And just customers pay by the hour for the infrastructure and everything else. But that works for some use cases, but on other use cases where customers need the data in-house in their own cloud provider tenants or even on-premise, that doesn't work at all. Um, or if you have like very high scale solutions where network latencies are very important and even if it goes um, just like to the same cloud provider to the same region, it's just another VPC and the latency is already too high. And for these use cases, we built hybrid cloud to combine the ease of use of a managed solution with the requirements that you want to have the databases completely under your control. So with hybrid cloud, we use the same cloud control plane where you can manage all your quadrant databases um, with an easy to use interface, with horizontal and vertically scaling, zero downtime upgrades, backup and disaster recovery, monitoring, alerting, and so on. Like all the day two operational tasks. But the databases themselves run them completely on the user's network using the user's storage and the user's compute. And neither we nor anyone else outside of the user's organization has any access to the databases or the data inside of it. The way we define this within Quadrant is that there is a cloud hosted control plane operated by us um, that allows all the easy management and two day two operations. And then the customer or user is able to choose the environment to run their databases completely freely. So technically all they need to bring is any kind of standard compliant Kubernetes cluster. Um, be it like on premise in their own data center, be it like on a cloud provider or even at the edge. If you look at like maybe supermarket stores or a manufacturing, manufacturing line or something like that, where they also may want to use vector searches. And then they can hook this environment up to our cloud offering. Um, then they can use the same management tools to manage all the databases. We receive the necessary telemetry to proactively help them. Uh, but the databases run completely on the customer side, completely isolated to then also fulfill the um, data sovereignty requirements and security requirements that customers have. Can you also talk about the timeliness of this release? Why now? Is there the product was kind of in its own cycle or the market has changed? You felt there was a lot of need. It all came... Like we have seen this already in our conversation with conversations with customers since like half a year or eight months or so. That now for a lot of organizations, especially enterprises, they like a year ago they started experimenting with generative AI. They built like the first pilots, and now it's getting into production. And that's where usually then also the security departments come in, and data sovereignty uh, becomes an important topic because it's not just any more test data; it's actually potentially sensitive customer data that is included in there. And then the operational aspects of where are my databases actually running becomes widely important. And that's why we're going out with this now to actually address this question. Can you talk about the role of vector databases specifically for modern AI workloads and specifically Gen AI LLMs? The way where vector databases come in into generative AI um, and REC use cases is 
um, that instead of you having to completely uh, train a model based on your private and sen potentially sensitive data from scratch, which may cost millions of euros and take a long time, you can use a pre-trained ready-made LLM, for example, also an open source one. Um, and then you can take your private data, route this through the LLM to get vectors out of that, store these vectors in a vector database. And then every time where you ask a question to the chatbot, you can query the vector database to provide the necessary private context to answering the data through the LLM. And that um, works a long way with you being able to build a chatbot on your private data in a very cost efficient way. Bastian, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about Quadrant. Thank you for your time. Uh, you know, it's my pleasure. Yeah, it was my pleasure. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.